All right. So what have we have we been going through from last week? Yep. What is it? Pipe analogy. All right. Well, let's just do some uh, review. Well, what what is this pipe analogy? What are we what are we talking about? What have we learned last week? And by the way, yes, we are taking it one step at a time. I think this um, is such an invaluable study to know what we are, our makeup, what the scripture tells us about who we are as we are um, making our way to understand, okay, mental health, what is that mental health? And other other studies, this pop analogy is not directed to um, explain mental health from the scripture, but it's only, but far more than that, it's, you can say it's way of sanctification, how we can grow in our sanctification, okay? So what is this pipe analogy? What do we know from last week, from the scriptures that we looked at? Christ works through us. Okay, good. What else? Yes, Valeria. And how does God work through us? Well, you draw a pipe and yeah. that has two ends. The one side has the inlet and the other side has the other end has the outlet. Through the inlet we receive from God. Yeah. And it goes through the pipe, goes through us, works in us, through us, and give it out to people. So what we receive from God, we can then, you know, serve the people. The yeah. People. Excellent. That's principle number one. It seems from many passages that we looked at last week, that the scripture lends uh, lends it to us that we may say that we are kind of a pipe where God wants to work not just in us, but through us. We're meant to have an inlet and an outlet. Um, better to say, God, I, I want you to work through me than just... Uh, God, I want to be uh, a tool in your hand, in your hands, all right? If I want to be useful, there is no usefulness in me other than when God works in and in through me. That's what usefulness is in the Scripture. Pipe, okay? What else? So that you can say that this is the first principle what we spoke about last time. What's, what's another thing that we've learned? Who's meant to be in the inlet and who's meant to be in the outlet? All right, Mia, what did you want to share? Uh, yeah, God's meant to be at the inlet and people are meant to be at the <laughs> Sometimes we change these around uh, when we take God out of the equation. Yeah. And so people end up being at the inlet and we expect God to be at the outlet. Yeah. You do understand this? Anybody wants to flesh it out a little bit more? Yes, Maria. So like you explained, I hear from phone as uh, that our inlet like said system not should be our husband or our children or our job and work mm. but God Jesus Christ yeah uh, word of God yeah so in this way we can do will of God mm. and yes and this I really thinking about how yeah. this is true and how often we can like swap in different direction we can yeah. more concentration in our family or in job or something yes yeah. and this is many so good many times we have the tendency to change the orientation of that pipe and 
when God was meant to be in the inlet, and we spoke at length what that means, you go back and study in, it's an, on the web, right? I trust it's on YouTube at the moment. You, 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 when, when God is meant to be at the inlet, we have that, we have this gravitational pull to turn it around and, and let God to be at the outlet and let our closest family or work or fun or soccer to be in the inlet. And what does it mean to be in the inlet? It means that's where we get our joy, strength, love, everything from. And this is our need. All right. I need you. I can't do this right because you're not fulfilling my need at the soul level, right? Not the physical. Of course, at the physical, um, you know, you need uh, a bread winner, right? To bring bread on a table. We're talking literally, that's physical. But we're talking about the soul. Listen to me. If you have an unbelieving husband, unbelieving wife, it really doesn't matter. You're not better off or worse off, whoever you have, insofar as the inlet is concerned, we all have to have who? God. Right? God is meant to be at the inlet. And when we begin to feel we crippled and we can't function the way we're intending to function. And we say, oh man, I just can't, can't pray. I can't read the word or I can't, um, um, be a faithful, uh, member in the church. I can't, and I just, something internal makes me, I just can't, I can't. You bet. Something happened in that pipe. You have placed someone at the inlet that you never meant to be. And you made him function as though he is God. You're trying to draw your sense of well-being and identity and security from someone who is not able to provide you with all of that. And we looked at that last week. We'll look at it a little bit more this week, but let's just continue. All right, what else? All right. And maybe another thing that we looked at predominantly, what resides, what is it that resides in the inlet? Our affections. That's what we're really talking about. Okay. Remember the passage we looked at last week? Um, One John five twenty. If someone says I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar, right? We looked at this. You can't say I'm receiving the love from God. That's the kind of love that we have towards God. It's a receiving kind of love. I can't be saying that, and yet at the same time, on the other end, I'm hating my brother. What? What happened to the love? How did that love end up being hatred? And um, John is saying it can't be. If that affection is here, then that affection is going to come out at the other end. Yep. Sorry, I just wanted to correct. I think it's meant to say First John four twenty. Is that meant to be four? Yeah, um, because when I looked it up, First John five twenty, it's a different verse. I don't know how that ended yeah. up. Maybe I clicked on the cursor somewhere. Thank you very yeah. much for highlighting this. That's good. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Let's, I've got a few passages that I want to look at. I want to again identify or affirm this concept of pipe. We need to understand a little bit more. And then Lord willing, we'll have time to go through. Okay. How do we apply this? How do we capitalize on this reality and then, and, and, and use it so that we can grow? Okay. Uh, this is where I'm heading today. We need to understand that our growth, we are responsible for our growth and there are things that we can do to help us to grow. Now, look what it says here. <clears throat> God works in you. You work out. That's, that's taken from Philippians, by the way, Philippians 2, right? So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out. So there is, there is that idea of 
out and in, right? So you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, all right? For it is who works in you? God. Always you find God ought to be at the inlet. Always, right? And so, and because he's in the inlet, he's driving everything that is holy and right. He's driving the way that you ought to function the right way. Okay? Then he says, yeah, for it is God who works, who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And so he says, do all things without grumbling and disputing or disputing. God is working in you. Doesn't matter what, who else is doing what, right? That's the point here. You read that in context. And, and the only thing that you can get out of this is this. If God is in the inlet, all right? If God is supplying everything that you need, doesn't matter. The moral condition of my husband or the moral condition of my spouse, I should say, or where my son is or, 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 or my manager at work and how annoying he would be. Paul is focusing here and he says God is in the inlet. He's working both to will and to do in, in. And therefore, because he's in the inn and he's giving you all that you need, what ought you get on the other side? Obedience. Right? What else? Humility, whatever. <clears throat> grumbling, no grumbling, no disputing. So if we actually break it down and, and then begin to analyze it deeper and say, okay, why am I grumbling? Why am I disputing? Uh, and you go back to the root cause. What is the root cause of me grumbling and disputing? Well, okay, so if we take it one step at a time, well, fear and trembling is not there. Well, why is it not there? Well, God is not there. God is not working in me, or I'm not aware, or I'm not capitalizing on that. You take away God from the inlet, you will take away fear and trembling, you take away fear and trembling, you take away ground, you'll ta you, you will have grumbling and complaining instead. Always works this way. Let me show you something else that we come across many times. And, and I know, you know, we have faithful commentators and faithful expositors of God's word, but I want to help you to see it <clears throat> from that pipe analogy perspective so that you can have a, even a better understanding of this tension, this passage that makes us feel like, oh man, we want to, Look away, look away. We don't want to look at this, but, but we want to help understand it. In a lot of what we read, what we studied last week, and in the light of what we spoke about today. <clears throat> this is a very famous passage in Luke 14. All right? And this is Jesus. Jesus is saying this to everybody. Right? Remember, receiving love and giving love. Receiving love is one thing. Giving love is another thing. It, it, there are two different types of love, right? Yeah? Okay. And Jesus says, if anyone comes to me and does not what? Wow, that's a pretty, pretty strong word. Hate. Right? It's just heavy. I mean, that's not, even Muslims wouldn't even say that. <laughs> it 
does not hate who? Not even his enemies. Forget about enemies. <laughs> he goes even to the father, to the mother, wife, children, and brothers and sisters. What? It's the ones that you're meant to love the most. I mean, what do they have all in common? Oops. Their, their relatives. What else? Close, closest relationships. Right? And Jesus is saying, yes, even your own life, you cannot be my disciple. Unless you hate the closest relationship to you, you cannot function as a Christian. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be a Christian, cannot function as a Christian, cannot live as a Christian. A Christian is someone, according to this, and when I understand it, who hates the closest people to him. Well, now that you understand the different kinds of love and the inlet and the outlet, what is Jesus saying? Yes, Cynthia. That none of those people you're in a relationship with are going to be your inlet. Absolutely. Absolutely. What Jesus is saying, listen, buddy, <laughs> listen. You better make sure who is in the inlet. Jesus Christ, that's what you ought to do. It is only exclusive to him. Is he saying that you really hate them? No. And I know some people who try to explain this, they say, oh, you've got to love Jesus a lot more uh, than your husband and wife and children, all that. So much of the love that you have compared to, it looks like hatred. I get that, I understand. But, it, but if you look at it carefully, no, he's not actually saying that. He's actually hate. And do you know what that means? Yes, love them. But all the love you ought to have for these people, whether father, mother, wife, children, all the kind of love that you meant to have for the most precious people to you are ever meant to be at the outlet. Don't ever have them in the inlet. And in fact, if you ever, ever, Search your heart. If you ever uh, do some soul searching and you find that this group of people are on this side, by the way, what do we call that if they are on this side? Idols. If you ever find them as idols, what do you have to feel? you got to hate that. you got to abhor that. Remember last week when we talked about Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. What did God say um, to heaven and the angels? Be, a, be what? A Paul. I still think I still have it here. I believe you should. <coughs> yeah. Be a Paul. Oh, heaven said this, and shudder, be very desolate. It's the same thing. Be disgusted. I mean, it's not meant to be the case, right? And Jesus here is saying the same thing. Brothers, if we ever find something other than Christ in the inlet, someone, someone, no matter how old he is, just because he looks cute and harmless, Right? or big and you think that you want to show off with having, no matter what kind of person. And you ever discover him being in your inlet, what ought you feel? 
Same as heaven. Yuck. It's disgusting. I don't want to have my wife in there. I don't want to have my husband. These are the people, by the way, if you actually think about it carefully, are the, are we are most vulnerable idolizing. Right? These are the people that we are most vulnerable idolizing. True or not true? Yeah? And God says, Jesus says, no, 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 no. They've got to be eliminate. Uh, we don't take any prisoners. They all have to be slaughtered in the heart, in the idols. As idols concerned, no. The moment you consider them as idols and you realize that, hate it, reject it, run away, only Christ is the source of your strength, encouragement, and boasting in Him. You boast in Him alone. And it's a fight. It's a struggle that we have to continue to, to, to fight. No one is perfect. But Jesus basically saying, you cannot function as my disciple. You cannot function as my follower. If you don't have that kind of attitude, if you have the attitude, if you don't have the attitude that says, I don't want to have anything in my inlet but Christ alone. Yes, Paul. Practically speaking, um, can you provide an example of what the situation looks like? Just one example of what it means to hate All right. and love Christ, love God more. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not hate or love Christ more, but I know what you mean, right? Well, we all know what you mean. Okay, can somebody give us examples? So my children. Yeah. My children, um, is that what you're talking about? My yeah. children can be my inlet. And then out from my inlet that anybody who touches my children mm. in any way, <laughs> I'll get very upset. Yeah. So then my children have become my idol, mm. whereas there's no more God coming in because I'm not even being able to give grace or, um, you know, um, or perform forgiveness. I'm just using my idol for a reason why I'm angry. Yeah. Um, anyone else? Anyone else? Yes, Sammy. Uh, anytime anybody close to you is, ever gives you a hard time about anything, if you react in a sinful manner, automatically it's because that person is, is, is you see that person as you, your source of, of, contentment or happiness or joy and if if they're if if something happens and they're not becoming that they're not providing that joy for you anymore and you react it's because you've because they've become they've become an idol um mm. so that just sort of applies to you know in so many different ways mm. excellent that does that make sense so he's kind of generalized you want to have maybe a more specific example and not just a general general thing But that's a good that's a good that's a good summary, overarching summary. Mm. All right. Uh Mary. So I remember an example you gave and you I think you um was like a, like a good warning to the women as well. You know, if we don't have ours, you know, if we're not like in I think it was Psalm eighteen where um, um, uh, David was saying about the Lord, he is his shelter, his fortress. We're not doing that, basically. And um, then we will tend to put our husbands at the inlet, and then if not, maybe our son. And, you know, it'll just have a rip. Like, we'll just go to the next person, the next person, always trying to shove someone at the inlet. Yeah. But is I think what Paul is asking is example. Oh. Oh. Give us example, real-life example, so we yeah, sure. becomes closer to home. Okay, so um, 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 so I might I might um, 
become frustrated with my husband mm. if um, I'm not um, I he I'm um, he's not say uh, dealing with me in some with some understanding or something like that and so I I, w- I would sin because I would show a display anger I'd be getting upset about that why is that because I'm placing him at the inlet you know when I'm supposed to be getting that from Christ yeah and you were saying last week as well when we when um, the bottom line was that if what if we're drawing from Christ that is loving him mm. that is the a loving Christ is a drawing from Christ and so you would draw from who you love and who is supposed to be correctly placed at the inlet mm. hope a uh, question okay so like for example with Mary's um, example she's saying that She's been, she's gotten angry because Mark didn't um, treat her with understanding or something. So is it actually Mark who is in the inlet or is it her? Okay. um, Very good. That's actually going further and answering the question. Now, what is it that resides in the inlet? Let's talk about Mark and Mary now. (laughs) Poor Mark and Mary. Wait, wait, so, so wait, can I just ask my question? Ah, well, that was not your question. Ah, okay, yeah. It was my. Well, I didn't even get to finish. I didn't. Ah, sorry, I'm, I yet. just jumped ahead. So yeah. No, so I'm just saying. So is it accurate to say that 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 human is in the inlet rather than my does? Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah, yeah. Oh no. So I'm, yeah? all right. Well, okay. I'm. I'm. I, I should learn to wait for you, even though I already know what. Yeah, you. Okay. All right. So what is it that resides in the pipe? Affections, all right, good or bad or ugly, they're, they're residing in a pipe, according to my understanding what the scripture says. Okay, now, for those of you who were with us three weeks earlier, what do we have in, in the flesh? Passions, right? That's the kind of affection, right? So let's just call it passions, right? Now, how many passions do we have? Countless, right? Uh, the reason why you don't realize is perhaps one, maybe you're self-righteous and so you're blinded to see. Or the other reason is, uh, to be fair, is that you've managed to bring it under control. All right? You've managed to suppress it and keep it to bare minimum, which is a great thing. But just because you kept it under control, it doesn't mean it's not there. It's like weeds. Yes, when you work hard, you maintain the garden, you have low kind of view, uh, weed. It doesn't mean that the garden doesn't have weeds, it's just that you're managing it well. Great. But it doesn't mean it's not there, right? Countless of passions. Now, when one of those passions increase and becomes dominant, suppose, suppose, uh, Mark and Mary, no, no, no. Well, we're just generally, right? So poor, poor guys. All right. Uh, there is now in their pride, so much pride, all right? He wants to um, suck whatever he can get out of the inlet to fill up that pride, all right? He's thirsty to, to gratify that thirst, that hunger. So he places his wife here, right? And he says, okay, now I want you to be the source that would feel this passion. So what expectations would he have of his wife? Submit to me. Obey. I want to come home. I want to see. I worked hard at work and come home. I expect to see food in a table, on the table. Good food. Because I deserve good food. Kids are in order because I deserve this. And the more she's obeying him, the more he feels that, wow, I'm, I feel like a king, right? Coffee, I've got to have my right coffee. I've got to have the coffee, right sugar. Right. And I just, I, just want to, I just want to see her lifting me up and serving me. But he's not going to say that, right? What's he going to say? Come on, you, you know what the scripture says. I'm, I'm really concerned about you. 
I'm really troubled about you. So troubled about you that I can't even pray. I'm, I'm so upset. I'm so mad. I don't know what to do with myself. Like, I, and, and then he begins to, you know, comes out on the other end. What's going on? He's angry. He's upset. He's, he, he can't even control himself. He's, he's no longer functioning the way God is. And that gives it away. That in the, in the inlet, it, it, it it's not that he's got God and he's just caring unconditionally for his wife. No. He actually placed her at the inlet and he wants her to feed him, to serve him. Right? So that he can fulfill whatever issue that he has in there or that what sort of passion he has in there. You tracking with me? And that's how they play together. The pride and people. So we're not saying people are inside the pipe, you can't, but it's but they are serving those passions in me. All right, and you can replace you can replace pride by anything else that is passion in me. It could be comfort. I just want comfort. So she's not submitting, but the, the interpretation is different. The lens is different. It's not so much that I want her to elevate me, but I just want to have rest because that is my, my passion in me, urging within me to just want to have rest, right? So the, the guy comes across as he's so humble, but in reality, that's because the lust of the flesh is more powerful than the pride of life. You trying with me? Yeah? And it doesn't have to be only sin in the other end that exposes it. It could be that you're, you're keeping control. All right? Internally, what are you doing? You're boiling inside and you're grinding your teeth, right? But I'm keeping tame. Right? But at that point, at that point, yes, you are taming yourself. That's great. But you go back and you search yourself and you say, I'm, I want to learn. I want to go deep. I want to assess my own affections and those feelings that are rising all the time. Why am I feeling this way? And you want to be genuine before God. You don't want to be just uh, good morally from inter externally, but internally here there is war going on and you're kind of ignoring it. Well, so long as I didn't sin. I'm totally No. Why is it? And you ask yourself, have, have the courage to ask yourself, why is it when my spouse or my son or my daughter does ABC and yes, okay, I've kept my cool, thank God for that. But why is it internally, I feel like someone turned on the kettle and it's, you know, reaching 100 degrees. Why? Right? So don't just wait until you sin and say, oh, now I have to research search my heart. No, you know yourself. You know when you're just kind of fuming internally and you're cursing internally while at the outside you're smiling. We're pretty good at that, right? So you tracking with me? You understand? So th this is an example, uh, Paul, of how it works. Affections internally or passions or whatever, because that's the pipe. We're not talking about the pipe, meaning it's the heart. We're talking about heart and the flesh kind of combined. It's a different way of looking at it, right? And then we do place people at the outside, at the inlet, but they kind of engage with our own passions inside of us. Right? All right. Yeah. Um, is, it a possibility to, is it a possibility to place yourself at the inlet and the outlet of the pipe because you're a very self-righteous person, you're very prideful, and say someone rebukes you for something and you say, oh, no, no, I'm not going to talk to that person because they're in the wrong and I know I'm, the right, I'm in the right. So is it a possibility to have yourself, like to glorify yourself and – um, chase after, you know, yourself because you're such a self-righteous person. Yeah, it's called narcissistic. Yeah, yeah. And that's why Jesus says even his own self. Right? Easy, yeah. Yes, hope. Does that answer your question, hope? Yes. 
So, as a Christian, as a Christian, um, obviously in our flesh we have one like heaps of pleasures and bad stuff, right? Yeah. So, and they're always going to be in that pipe. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, when they're in that pipe, that means that like God will never be able to be in the inlet purely because those pleasures are like raging. Yeah. So my question is. How do you like, fix that? Uh, yeah, because exactly. they're always going to be there. I know. Yeah. How, how do you fix that? Yep. <clears throat> That's very good. So is, so is it true that there is a chat time when Christians have God <laughs> because the, the flesh is always there, you know? Yeah. 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 All right, let me ask you a question just before I tell you. Um, um, because you asked two questions. You asked the question, uh, is there any time when God is um, in the inlet? Look, w when can we really say, at what point in our lives can we actually say, yes, that moment I loved God with all my heart, all my mind, all my strength, is there any time that a Christian can say that? Right? At the same time, could a person really claim that he's born again? And yet he would say, I never ever love God with any part of or fabric of my heart, of my mind, or my soul, or my strength. Equally false. Because remember, there is flesh and a heart at the same time, working, operating at the same time. So what we can say in reality, in reality, we are having, yes, Christ here in reality. We're talking like if we uh, have a, a spiritual x-ray and we are having uh, you to scan and we read the report, we'll find that Christ is there, but there are other, other people there at the same time. Only Believers have this. For unbelievers, it doesn't matter how good they perform, no matter if, if they never sin, what, what would it look like in their inlet? Anything but Christ. Okay? This is just the way it is, right? So that's, and, and, and so your goal, Christian, your goal, believer, the war is that how do you eliminate this and maximize that? All right, that he would, according to John the Baptist, he must what? Increase. And I must what? In what sense? That's in the inlet we're talking about. Okay, so that he can actually be manifested through the pipe into the outlet as well. You tracking with me? Now, <clears throat> let me give you another, maybe another principle. The way to eliminate um, this part from here, actually, I should say, insofar as you have, you know, idols, whatever they are, Husband, wife, children, money, work, status. All right. You will have affection here that will clog up the pipe. Right? These guys over here will clog up the pipe. All right. Meaning I have pride. Jesus will not serve my pride. Jesus will not flow the easy through, through the, um, pipe of mine when I have a lot of pride and I'm outsourcing that um, feed from somebody else that is not Christ. Okay? Agreed? Someone who's got strong, powerful lust and urges, well, Jesus is not going to satisfy those urges of lust. Well, where, where will he outsource that feed from? Right? You got porn, you got this, you got that, right? Now, insofar as I have uh, those things, well, how do I, and, and of course, that's going to cripple 
my Christ likeness in the outlet. All right? It's going to be crippled. Well, how do I eliminate this? That's the, I believe, the principle. The principle to eliminate this bit here. Does anybody want to have a guess? <laughs> Call the plumber. No. This is where your duties uh, will shine. You're going to have to do certain things on this side to receive that and do certain things on the other side to reveal that because that's all you could do. And as you're doing from the inlet and doing in the outlet, that is how you bring this down. And you be, it keeps on shrinking. The more you do in the outside, you function as a plumber. Pretty much the same thing. You go and you work at the inlet and you just push, push and shove um, the good stuff in you. And at the same time, you unclog the outlet, you keep on letting it out until it flows. Where do we get that from? Okay. Actually, let me... Ugh, time. Let me give you a quick illustration to tell you about this. I know it's going to take time, but there are a couple of passages I wanted to address, but if we go over time, we'll do it next week. All right. I, I did this with some of those people who I did counseling with. Suppose you live in Taylor's Hills. Most of you live in Taylor's Hills or thereabout, Carolina Springs. All right. And let's say, um, for whatever reason, China decided to blow up Australia. And they wanted to start with Taylor's Hills. All right. They were going to blow up that suburb. They don't like it. They don't like the people there. So we're going to eradicate it. All right. But for whatever reason, they, they, they realize that Caroline Springs uh, has a lot of Chinese people, so we're not going to blow up Caroline Springs. Tell us yours, Caroline Springs, okay? And you're sitting there, and you are so scared because you know you live in tells you any minute you, you hear missiles bombing and, and the ground is shaking, and oh man, what's going to happen to me? And, and then you run and you hide under the bench and you're scared to even go to the toilet. So, you, you know, you, you let it go and, you, you know, it's, it's just you're a big mess. Now, suppose that there is a fireman who comes to you and says to you, listen, I, I have 100% track record to take people from this suburb, Tellers Hills, all the way to Caroline Springs into this safe haven and nothing will harm you. That's a track record. You walk with me, I'll take you one step at a time and you will be in that place where you are most safe and I've done it a million times and none of those people who followed those, followed me, um, uh, well, uh, got hurt. And you look at the track record, you say, yeah, it's true. You kind of begin to kind of breathe again and relax. And you close your eyes. You say, yes, I will follow you. With all of my heart, I will follow you. And you open your eyes. Where do you see yourself? Under the kitchen bench, right? Where you were. <clears throat> because, because he didn't say to you, close your eyes and open your eyes and I will take you. He said to you, what do you do? You follow me step by step and I will take you there. Right? So if you say, yes, yes, you're my savior. You can do it. I trust in you. 
I'm just going to kick back and relax under my kitchen bench. What's going to happen to you? You're going to get blown up. Right? Because the rule was, what do you have to do? Follow him. Right? So likewise, you've got not China, you've got Satan, and he is throwing bombs at you. And internally, you, you've got a big mess. You've got a war internal, right? You've got pride, control, attitude, all kind of terrible, wicked passions. And you don't do anything. You just close your eyes and you open your eyes and you say to Jesus, Jesus, I trust in you. How is that going to help you? That's the difference between when you're being justified, but being sanctified is totally different. You've got to do something. Do something. For example, I've got a couple of examples here. I don't know if I can go through both of them, but I, it's just an example to show you that, okay, once I identify something internally that is not right, something's got to be done. At which end? Both ends. And again, that's another problem. Okay, because a lot of times, okay, yes, we ruled out this. A lot of times people just close their eyes and open their eyes and they think everything's sorted, but later on, they're still the same people as what they were. The second problem is that people say, okay, you know what? I'm just going to go pray and sing songs until I have goosebumps and I read about the attributes of God and I learn all this beautiful stuff. Surely it's going to have affected me. That's true. It's nice. But if that's all that you do, it's not going to help. It's not going to help. And, of course, you've got the other ones who focus at the other. We've got to focus at both ends. At both ends. Look at this. Be anxious for nothing. <clears throat> Just for the sake of time, this person here, he's identified with anxiety. All right? And Paul is counseling that man. He's got anxiety. All right? He's anxious over just about everything. All right? What do you do? In everything, by what? Prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. This is, brothers, sisters, this is do stuff here. Right? Because when you pray, who do you pray to? Right? That's him you supplicate. And he tells you what you ought to do. You've got to be thankful. Right? Well, whatever it is, I don't want to go into too much detail because it's not about the nuance. Uh, nuance. It's not about the details. It's, it's just about the idea. I want to give you the idea, right? So in one hand, he says, let your request be made known to God. Not only do you have to pray, but you have to pray in a particular way, right? There's anxiety here. What are we meant to replace this anxiety with? Makes sense, right? Right now, the pipe is clogged. There's anxiety. Um, in other words, that man is not <clears throat> brought in front or in the presence of God with the right attitude. He probably goes there and he grumbles all the time. He whinges to God, which is good. It's not a bad thing. But he doesn't bring it across with thanks, with thankfulness. They're just supplication, supplication, supplication. God, please help me. My car is broken. My cat is not eating. My dog is not giving birth. And, you know, all, and, and, but I'm not really thankful to God. He just, deals with God as though there's nothing to thank him about. He says, no, if you're anxious, you got to do something in the inlet. And then he says, <clears throat> Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is good of good report, if there's any 
excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on those things. What do you mean by that? And by the way, he didn't move away to another idea. Why? Because again, he stresses on the God of peace. First, he calls it the peace of God and then says the God of peace. By the way, what's the difference between the two? Can you really have God without peace? Or can you have really true peace without God? Same thing, right? All right. The God of peace will be with you. Practice those things. The things you have learned, received, heard, seen in me. Now that's at the end of the book of Philippians. Right? And Paul says, whatever you learned, practice these things. Well, what are the things that we've seen in Paul? I tell you one part of the thing that you cannot run away from. Ah, oh, how much has he given encouragement? You've got to practice these things. You know, book of Philippians chapter 1, right? How much has he shown his intimacy and practiced those things? His, his praiseworthy, to, sorry, his, his prayer request for other believers, for example. Um, how much in Philippians has he encouraged those Philippians? Right? He's done a lot of things in the outlet as well. He hasn't just only done the inlet. Otherwise, he wouldn't have even written that letter. But he's done a lot of stuff in the inlet and a lot of stuff in the outlet. All right? Again, time is always against us. So I just want to move quickly to another example and we can break it down more and understand it more, but but there is a point that I'm trying to bring across. <clears throat> Again, in the same letter, the letter of Philippians, he says this, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind. And he kind of combines two things. He combines in that pipe, there is affection of selfishness, selfishness, or an empty conceit, another way of saying arrogance. Don't do it out of arrogance. Don't do anything out of arrogance. All right? All right, he says, but humility. And, and you know what? They, they go hand in hand, right? Yeah? It's true that this is the reason why he put them together. When you are selfish towards people, you are arrogant towards God, right? Or when you're arrogant towards God, automatically you're selfish. Every arrogant person is a selfish person. How does that work? Can you see that? Do you understand what that means? If you're arrogant, you're selfish, right? Because who's the most important person to you? Yourself, you deserve this cake, and you don't want to give me one. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you guys. All right. You deserve this. You deserve this coffee. I deserve this thing. What is the best thing? I deserve this when we play soccer on Saturdays. Those people, those kids, they want to be the best team, part of the best team. I deserve this. I don't care. I don't want to be part of the losing team. I want to be in the winning team. I deserve this. Right? And when you carry that attitude with you, you will be selfish. And you trace it back, you will find because there is arrogance. They go hand in hand. So how does, how does Paul try to attempt to help us with this? <clears throat> you want to fix arrogance? It's got to be humility. And you want to fix selfishness, regard one another more important as yourselves, okay? Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. That's one thing. And the second thing is, what is it? Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. One minute he says to you, all right, do something towards the brethren. 
that you were once selfish towards, do something towards them. And in the other minute is, he says to you, look at Christ. And you know there is the continuation of that passage, right? He begins to behold Christ. Look at the attitude of Christ. Learn from Christ. Enjoy Christ. Dwell in Christ. And, and that's how you overcome arrogance and selfishness. Stay with me. Selfish. How do I get rid of selfishness? Remember um, the disciples. They kept in fighting against each other. What was the underlying issue that they were fighting each other about? Can you imagine that? Imagine I get Ralph and me and Jean and, you know, whatever, whoever in the stage and we fought among ourselves. And, Man, I'm the greatest. I said, no, 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 no. I'm the greatest. It's silly talk, right? But such were the apostles. All right? They kept silent for on the way they had discussed with one another which of them was the greatest. That's so embarrassing to even talk about this. It's just, all right? Now, selfish, arrogance. That's arrogance, right? Now, how did Jesus try to help him with it? Sitting down, he called the 12 and said to them, if anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and what? So what do you have to do here? You've got to serve. You've got to serve. Servant of all. What does servant of all mean? You've got to serve others, right? You've got to serve others, which is what, you, what Paul says here. Do not look out, look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. You've got to do what? What does it mean to look out for the interest? What does it mean to look out for the interest? Hey, Lydia, you know, this uh, lady, she kind of needs a bit of money. Mm, that's interesting. Is that what it means, look out for the interest? What does it mean? Identify their needs and talk about it? What does it mean to look out for the interest? Serve their needs, Right? In one hand, Paul tells us, focus on Christ. That's the inlet. You've got to do something to focus on him, to dwell on him, to study him. But yet, at the same time, what do you have to do? Right? Well, my arrogance translates to me being selfish towards whom? In the context of this. The brethren. And Paul is saying, okay, I'm going to help you to address this. I'm going to help you to know how to hold the hands of the fireman to, to follow his footsteps one step at a time. How, Paul? Well, open your eyes to Jesus Christ. See how humble he, he is or he was when he was on earth. Understand that. Reflect on that. Let your heart dwell on that. But don't stop there. Some people like to stop there. Oh, I've got an issue with pride. I'm going to focus on the humility of Christ. Read a book about the humility of Christ. Down deal, sort of. No. You're bluffing. You've got to, yes, you've got to study him. But not only that, you've got to let that flow through you and come out by outward focused. You think about others. In a lot of that, you think about others. You serve others. You, 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 you lift them up. You, you begin to make sacrifices for the others. You tr you, and then what happens over time is that you begin to treasure them. And as you are treasuring them, because that's like Christ, right? Right? Over time, he said, 
What happened? I was struggling with selfishness, but what happened? I began to attack one step at a time to Caroline Springs. I'm no longer in that rage, internal rage anymore. Right? Some people run quickly to serve and they tick the boxes of being an outlet. They do everything right, but they ignore where they get that um, strength from. And, and others go in the other extreme and they just focus in here. In here. They just want to have devotion and they think they can go and have the best quiet time and study the scripture and read the scripture and find about a God. And, and, that, and you know what? They go and they do that and then they come out and guess what happens? They're just as selfish as they were before. It doesn't work. Why? Because your growth, brothers and sisters, is not reduced to only having to study what Christ was like. Otherwise, those theologians would have been the most godly men, but they're not. They're not necessarily true. Yes, you've got to study him and you've got to know him, but you've got to do something what you, with what you're learning. You tracking with me? Which one is important, the inlet or outlet? Both. And if it's clogged anywhere, you're stuck. You don't want it to be constipated. All right, you got to clear it out. Yes. So, I just I'm just confirming that is that is the working out your salvation. Um, and sorry to be repetitive, but what is, how would you do all that? What is the fear and trembling part? How do you, what is working it out with fear and trembling? What is working out with fear and trembling mean? That's a very good question. It's 830, sister. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe we'll cover a little bit about that next week and then we'll move on to something else.